Maverick. Noun. Unusual person. A visionary. Leader. Go-getter. An independent thinker. They see the vision for their life and pull that future towards them with an unyielding belief that things can and must be better. They achieve what most won't. Innovative, influential, daring, and direct with a remarkably high tolerance for taking calculated risk. A foe to the status quo. This is Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks. Your host, Neil Timmons, has been involved with over $300 million in real estate transactions. He's a published author, commercial property investor, and real estate syndicator. This show is for those who want to learn how to earn passive income through real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Neil Timmons. During this episode, you're going to discover how to actively and passively invest in both multifamily and self-storage and how Ian gone from a firefighter to over $100 million in real estate. For those of you who are new, I'm your host, Neil Timmons, and I love passive income from real estate. Before I introduce you to today's Maverick, I want to re make a request. If at any point you like what you're hearing, give us a thumbs up or subscribe to the show to make sure you never miss an episode. If you love it, well, please give us a written review. Plus, be sure to take a look at the description below of this episode as we packed it with thousands of dollars in free resources. So today, we're going to have the pleasure to learn from Ian Horowitz. And prior to his career in real estate, he was a full-time firefighter. All that changed in about 2000, 2007, 2007, 2008, during the financial collapse. He was a firefighter at the time. And what he was figuring out is while he was on the front lines of riots in Baltimore, that what he was doing isn't going to get him to where he wanted to go. He wanted to find a way to make a better life for his family. So I would describe today's real estate maverick as someone who's passionate about operations and deal structuring, along with running his fully integrated business and helping his friends and his family invest. Today's Maverick, Ian Horowitz. Ian, how are you? Good. How you doing, Neil? Good. I'm great. Thanks, man. I'm excited. To, I'm excited you're here. It's fun. Uh, you know, you've got a varied background, so it's going to be cool to dive into this to have a conversation. Tell me, you know, we all got started somewhere, somehow, some way. How'd you end up in real estate? Uh, I ended up in real estate in the most non-traditional way. I was, we were actually, um, my business partner and I were actually firemen for the city of Baltimore. Uh, so if you ever watched The Wire, which was on HBO, or yeah. you saw the riots that happened during riot season when all that stuff was going on, that's that's where we worked in the heart of West Baltimore. And we took on those careers. We stepped in. It was a, a passion job, right? Like, you know, it's a good job at the core value of what we do. It was a core, you know, it's a great job. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the financial crisis and everything else that was going on, my business partner and I both said, Hey, like there's gotta be a better way to earn income. And ultimately we both came to real estate in two different trajectories. I came to real estate from the fact of, Hey man, like I want to do something where I don't have to hustle all this side work and I want to earn money around the clock. And while I'm asleep at work or I'm on a fire or God forbid I die, my wife could always earn money and take care of our family. And I was like, well, real estate is the best thing. Because if I had an operating business, there's like, imagine her trying to step in and handling a contracting or a landscaping business. She could probably do it, but I wouldn't want that burden for her. Uh, and my business partner actually stepped into real estate through um, wholesaling. And we grew up outside of Philadelphia together. Mm, yeah. and we both kind of took different trajectories. And the way we got connected was he wholesaled me a house that had burned down while we were at work and that we were both working. And he's like, Hey, I got this lead. You want to buy it? And we wound up joining, uh, I want to buy that one off of him. And then after that, he brought a package of houses and then off we went. But yeah, like, so real estate came about more of a, of a need of a, of a way to secure a new retirement than it really did of like, oh, I want to go out and build this massive business, which it's turned into today. Yeah. It was more of, hey, I'm trying to secure a retirement because I'm worried about the pension system. I'm worried about what it looks like 20, 30 years from now. Will the city be able to support us? Well, it's interesting. You, you hit a spot on the head. I think you, you said something that I think resonates with uh, people who sit in your or my shoes, meaning active um, you know, general partners, people going out and actively doing this. But also those who passively do this, 
They're concerned about the retirement. They're concerned about pension. They're concerned about, you know, running out of money and making sure that it goes, goes to work for them. Um, and I know you deal with a number of past investors. I suspect that you get the same thing echoed back to you. Yep. Oh, yeah. And we just met with some investors yesterday. We were talking about this today uh, when this thing's being recorded. I think they're talking about whatever's going on with the oil and China and the Saudis and all the US dollars. Like there's so many things that you got to worry about. Whereas if you own tangible real estate, whether it's you as the active owner or you as the passive investor, you're owning something tangible. So no matter what happens to the dollar, it's something that's real, something that people need. We're in multifamily and self storage. One asset class is debatably more needy than the other one, but in the end, they're both a need of some sort. And owning something tangible is much more viable than owning stocks and uh, even a pension system or a 401k. They, they, they put you into these traditional um, uh, investment plans. And you know, I don't want to go off, off the rails in your first five minutes of the podcast, but you know, take the politics out of it. They want you to go into these things, but does anyone really intrinsically understand what you're buying when you're buying a stock? You're buying a piece of paper. You don't You don't even really know what you're buying. When you buy real estate, you can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can do something with it. If you passively invest with it, you could always get on a plane and go out with the sponsors and say, hey, I wanna go see this deal. And that was really the big difference for us. Like when we first got started, it was so hard for me to understand, to be like, man, I need to save up so much money, stick it in the stock market, pray everything goes right, to earn a retirement. And I was like, man, what happens if like 30 years, there's like this stock market crash and I go to retire and I can't retire. I mean, being a fireman is a young man's game. Uh, really any any blue collar type trade or first responder, that's a young man's game or a young woman's game. It's, it's hard to go and work 30, 40 years. It's not like what it used to be. Right. And to get to the end of your career, not knowing if you're being able to retire, that's like scary. Whereas if like real estate, when I looked at it, I said, all right, someone's willing to finance me this property. I don't have $150,000 to buy a single family house, but they're willing to put up a hundred thousand and I got to bring 50 or whatever the numbers are. They're willing to do that. And someone else is going to pay the rent and pay that mortgage down. And I'm going to make a little bit of cash flow. Someone's financing my future net worth. And I was like, man, that's like, that's beyond powerful. And it's like, all right, well, at the end of 30 years, if I, I you got, so like what we have today and what I initially wanted, I'll, all I wanted was 10 houses. I was like, well, if I have 10 houses and they're all paid off after 30 years, that's like a million and a half bucks, even if they're not worth another dollar more than what I paid for them. Yeah. And I was like jumping for joy. And, but it was tangible to me. And that was the big difference to try to do that in the stock market. Forget it, dude. There's no way, no way I could do that. Um, and that's really, what led us into real estate and what led us into investing in it. And really just from our standpoint of the capital that we had on our side, we had to be active investors. We didn't have the opportunity right. to be passive investors. Should we have more cash or we had the wherewithal to have more cash to be passive investors? Probably would have considered it and continued down our fire department career trajectory. And again, you just need to know what you want and what you're trying to accomplish on your end of things. Tell me, uh, you eventually work your way out of single families into multifamily and into self-storage. Tell me about the first, I'll call it commercial, I'll lump those two together. Tell me about the first commercial. What was the first commercial deal you bought? So the first commercial deal we bought was a seven unit uh, apartment building in Baltimore. And at that time, man, we had probably flipped a hundred houses by then. And we probably had 70 or 80 single family rent rent rentals under our belt. And we always heard in the commercial world, you know, just like, you know, you get your opportunity to do a deal. And I saw this seven unit building, we fired an offer off and we didn't win it on the initial. And about 60 days later, we got a phone call from the broker that said, hey, the first guy bailed, do you want to buy this building? And we said, wow, this has got to be it. So we jumped in, we bought it. But it was scary to us, which which sounds crazy. It was a four hundred fifty thousand dollar purchase price. It was nothing crazy. You got to remember, most of the houses we're buying are twenty five to fifty grand. You know, our average home price is like one hundred fifty grand. Well, this thing wasn't that much bigger. It was just like I don't know why we put it on a pedestal, and I know everybody does this. And it was like um, I don't know, man. Like we're nervous. We're nervous. But we did it. And thank God we did. Because once you complete one deal, when I don't know if you guys know, but like 
when people say commercial brokers start to find you, we did that one deal next year, the phone's ringing every day. Hey man, I know she bought uh so-and-so area in park. You know, we have this deal available. We have this deal available. Next year you like start building, excuse me, those network of brokers and the deal started flowing through just by doing that one deal. Um, and the cool thing was on that deal, it was small enough that we could put our own capital into it. We didn't have to raise any capital. It took us another probably two years from that until we started really taking on investor capital, which again was like wild to us because people don't realize like doing one deal, like if you could do one deal and execute it really well, mm -hmm. everything else follows suit. You just got to be able to do that one deal. Let me go back and ask a couple of questions about that one. How did you actually find that one? Was it listed for sale? Or just stumbled across yeah. it. Yeah, it was like 2017 ish. Yeah. So it was probably on LoopNet or Crexy or one of the local brokers that I probably followed. The guy's name was Ben Frederick in Baltimore, uh, and I think I was on his email database. And I, I happened to see it. I mean, he doesn't have like any crazy, you know, like Marcus and Millichap or someone like that CBRE type pro formos. It was more of a a word doc. And when I looked at it, I was like, man, those numbers. I don't know why something just clicked in my head of making sense. Now, leading up to that, you got to remember, like I used to tell people, or I still tell people we had a competitive advantage. I we'd be working 24 hour shifts and I'd just be looking at my email. We'd be stuck on a Metagron. And when I was driving the engine, I would just sit there and click through my phone and just like, look at deals, try to underwrite them. Like I was underwriting all these deals leading up to that because we were in the single family mindset and it was a big mind shift. And what maybe it wasn't even a mind shift. It was all right, I can do a house on the back of my hand. Like someone tells me a street name and a block, I'll tell you exactly what I'll pay for it. I know exactly how much it'll cost me to do. I know exactly what it's worth. And I think that was the big struggle getting into the commercial assets. It was like, oh man, I actually got to sit down and write, I actually got to underwrite these deals. I actually got to take the time to pull rent comps and construction costs and try to figure this out. And like pro forma, how long seven units are going to take me to renovate? Because it's not like you're buying a vacant house and it's right. done. Um, so that deal was on an email brokers list, uh, or I probably found it on LoopNet. Uh, and I had reached out to Ben and it's funny. We, I have known Ben for a long time, but it was even like, I still remember this. Like I called him. I was like, um, it's just like real Tim. And I was like, Ben, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that deal you got. And it's odd because I don't know if you guys can tell or if it's coming through, like I'm usually pretty confident in these yeah. things, but it was even like a gut check for me to go do that one deal. But again, Thank God we did it because it led us down to where we are today. Tell me about the most recent deal he did. Uh, the most recent deal we did, we just we just finished up a six million dollar. Well, actually, that's a lie. The most recent deal we did was a forty seven unit apartment building that we bought for. Um, we bought it for one point eight, and we raised roughly one point two for it. It's forty seven units, and it'll be worth about 5 million bucks plus or minus completely vacant bank foreclosure came through a broker funny story i'll tell you how that one came about is i was doing our podcast i was interviewing a buddy of ours who's a lender a commercial lender and i was we were interviewing at the end of it jason's like hey a buddy of mine is a receiver for a bank he's out in san diego he's got this deal in baltimore it's 47 units you should buy it and i was like okay cool let me talk to him well, when I talked to him, they're like, yeah, we're about to list it with Justin Verner, the broker. And I was like, well, cool. Justin Verner has our single family house portfolio for sale. We've done a lot of business together. So I called him up and that's ultimately how we connected on that deal before it ever got to market. And we wound up competitively winning there. Um, and it's a cool deal. It's been in foreclosure since 2018. Wow. It's more or less completely vacant. Uh, it's got a lot of challenges. So we're looking forward to the challenge. We lift there is what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, that, I'm, but that's our that's our strong suit. Uh, we have roughly 13 employees. Uh, seven of them work based right out of Baltimore. We have project managers and construction guys and maintenance guys and office people who handle everything. So it just fits into our system, right? Yeah. So when we saw this, I was like, "Hey, Ryan, do you want Ryan's our corporate term COO? He runs the operation. So Ryan, you want to take on another project?" He's like, "Yeah, we can handle this, and it's a good fit for our guys. We have all the guys that can go in there." and knock it out start to finish really quick. And, you know, over time, I think most people will find out their strong suits. Like our strong suit is doing the capital improvements and structuring the deal. Yep. Whereas some other people, they just throw money at problems. 
We don't always have money. And early on, we didn't have money to throw at problems. We were just dumb enough to go and do it over and over and over again because we were firemen, right? Like when something's on fire, I can't leave that scene until the emergency is mitigated, right? It's the same thing when we do real estate. Most people, oh no, there's a problem. Sell it. I'm done. Or throw money at it. It's like, all right, there's a problem. And I'm going to go back every single day until it's fixed over and over and over again. And I think we learned that from the fire department that now applies here because there's challenges on that 47 unit building. Dude, it's been baking for right. two years now. They had drug dealers that overran the place. Like we got all kinds of issues there. But again, like we know how to go in there with our team and do the capital improvements in a timely manner. And that's that's where we excel. Contrast what you just described in the, the manner, the type of deals you buy on the apartment side in comparison to uh, the self-storage units. So I would say in the residential side of things, whether it's multifamily or single family, which we haven't bought in a long time, uh, but mostly the multifamily, we look for value add deals. Nine times out of 10, the value add in the multifamily is a little more construction or capital improvement intensive. Whereas in the self-storage world, it's a little bit more management improvement and management intensive, right? Because you can only fix a metal building, right? right? We're talking about a square box, 10 by 10 with a door on it. And we're, you know, when we do capital improvements on there, we talk about paving, security cameras, lighting, and maybe some door improvements. Other than that, there's not much to do. It is an intense management issue. So it fits well with us. It can be straining at times because there, it's a lot more management intensive. There's a lot more move-ins, move-outs, but there's not the heavy lift of the capital improvements. So for us, it's like, all right, as we build this team, we have the proper office staff to help us to say, hey, like we're going to take this on. Let's work on these improvements over here. And then our, our construction, and we can buy out of area, right? Like that was the other big thing for us. We made a decision early on, and I don't know it's because we operate in Baltimore. I mean, Baltimore is a tough town to operate in from a legal liability standpoint, contractor standpoint, I got scared to go buy residential units outside of our jurisdiction because we just know all the red tape in our jurisdiction. Buying self-storage allowed us to go and get market diversity because we can run them remotely and it's more of a management branding play like a hotel or an airline versus the residential side of things where it's usually more capital, um, capital improvement intensive. So those are really the two big differences in the end, we're underwriting real estate. Um, and I think this is where if you look at yourself and you treat your real estate operation like a business, it doesn't really matter what asset class you're operating in. You're running a business in each individual asset class. And I think too many people say, oh, I'm only a multifamily guy. No, you're not. Like You're a multifamily guy, but if you really apply what you do in multifamily to office, industrial, self-storage, Airbnbs, RV parks, you could apply all the same tasks there and start to create diversity with inside your portfolio. When you're looking at a deal in the self-storage space and in other markets, how do you identify the market in which you want to enter into? That one has been uh, a little challenge for us because again, like we've operated in Baltimore for so long that like, uh, this is actually, I guess, bad because we grew up outside of Philadelphia. You know, we spent a lot of time in the city and then we worked in the heart of West Baltimore, which is a really, really tough area. So like you go to a town sometimes you're like, oh, this is the worst part of the town. And like you roll up and there's like, there's nothing. I'm like, this area is not bad. Right. So it's like sometimes you're jaded when looking at it. Uh, but there's two things. Not only is there the physical, you know, to get out there on the site and go look at it. You also want to do your market demographics. So like when we look for self-storage, um, we kind of had like a tolerance between 35 and 45,000 of median household income um, for non-climate control type units, like your standard drive up units mm -hmm. and, you know, 60 to 70 grand for the, the climate. Now there's a blended rate in there, but we like, so we look at median household income and we look at uh, rooftops. We like, um, more populated areas. A lot of my friends, sure. uh, I'm a part of some groups, they do tertiary markets. I mean, we're talking like 800 people in a town. Again, worked in Baltimore City, grew up outside of Philadelphia. I'm used to seeing people. So it's right. like weird for me. Like we bought a deal in Livingston, Texas, which is north and east of Houston. The town size is only 5,000 people. 
that's extremely small for me. Every other place we operate, town size is 50,000 plus. And for the most part, they're capital cities. So I like the idea of having uh, the workforce there, having the bodies there, having people there. It's hard to flush out 50,000 people out of one town and they just disappear overnight. An 800 person town, 100 people move, you lost one eighth of your city really, really quick, you know? So yeah. that's why we like more populated areas. Now that brings a lot of competition with it because REITs yep. and private equity firms are chasing the same thing because they want the rooftops, but there's also competitive advantages with that because they're usually driving rates. They're usually promoting more sophisticated customers. Um, you can follow behind them. Uh, so for us, that's kind of what we look, look for in marketplaces. When you're talking to investors, what's the investor sentiment been over the course of the last, let's call it a quarter? Uh, how are investors feeling? What what kind of conversations uh, are, are you having relative to, you know, their emotional state? I guess their confidence level is probably a better word. I would think you probably have the same conversations. Uh, is the end of the world coming? I don't know. Otherwise, we'd be living on a private island somewhere. I don't have a crystal ball, but maybe, right? Uh, but people are nervous and I get it. But that's that's a good passive investor, right? Like I tell all of our investors that they should own real estate and they should be active. Don't just trust what I tell you, trust to verify, right? Get out there and ask us the hard questions. That's what we're here for. I want you to be knowledgeable of what your investment is. Um, so a lot of people have been asking questions. I've gotten a lot of phone calls to say, I need to get out of the markets. What deals do you have? Which is a good vote of confidence knowing that we're doing the right thing on our deals, number one. Right. Number two, they want to know where debt's going and they see prime. Well, we don't follow prime. We follow the five, seven, and 10 year treasuries, which are completely different than what prime's doing. So right. they see the news stories and it's like, well, that's not actually what happens in the commercial world. We're following a different rate. And while I don't want to say we're fine, they're not as bad as what you think they are. I mean, we're still getting quotes in 560, 570s. Uh, on some 10 year money, we just need to be committed to the project for that long. But ultimately, yeah, they just want to know that their money's safe and secure. They want to know that the assets are going to be good. And that's the advantage of buying, you know, having a diversification between multifamily and self storage is both have a need, you know, as markets become more turbulent, people need more storage because they start moving foreclosures, divorce, all, you know, all the bad things that happen in the world, but also the positives, you know, they want boat and RV storage. They're not going to use their RV as much. They're going to go house it somewhere. So they just want to know and communicate with them to say, Hey, like, here's what's going on and be transparent with them. And really most of the conversation around is where's debt? What do you expect? Are you going to continue to do deals in the foreseeable future? And the answer to that is we're always going to do deals. It doesn't matter what marketplace it is. You're going to do the best deal that's presented to you, no matter what the marketplace is doing. So fair to say that uh, the, the same conversations you and I are having people, uh, a segment of the population is concerned that the sky is falling. That doesn't just uh, live in a vacuum in passive investors. It also extends to active investors, which means there are people getting scared out of the marketplace who do what you and I do. And that creates other opportunities for the two of us to go out and, and, and strike. There's less competition than what there was a year ago. Correct. And if you listen to Warren Buffett, um, you know, I know he's a stock market guy. He said, Hey, when everyone's running out, we're running in. Well, guess what? It was the same thing I did in the fire department. They're all running out. We're running in to go save this place. It's the same thing. I love hearing pencils down, peace, see ya. I don't know if this is going to be on video. I'm giving the peace sign. Yeah. Um, but literally, it's like, oh, you're going to put pencils down, private equity firm and REITs, go put your pencils down. That is the best buying opportunity for us because you know what? If we're nimble to the market, if you can get something to pencil today and cash flow today at 6 7 8% debt rates, presumably as debt rates fall and you ep execute a business plan, there's going to be another equity pop on the back end that you aren't accounting for. Um, again, keyword, if they come down, because cap rates are directly correlated to whatever the debt's doing. So if you know par on debt right now is 6%, most of your class A stuff's going to trade between the five and sixes. Well, that goes back down to the two, 3%. That's why people are paying three, 4% you know, cap rates. I'm like, yo, I don't even understand. It's not the space we're in, but everything came down with that creating more value. So um, I think it's a great opportunity. I, and again, that's why I said, 
You're always going to do the best deal that's presented to you, no matter the marketplace. Yes, cap rates are down in the three to fours, crazy numbers. Money's flowing. But guess what? There's also a ton of competition for deals. Money dries up. Those of us that have passive investors, the wherewithal to buy deals in cash, the wherewithal to go get loans still, even in these economic climates, we have the competitive advantage right now. And this is when we're going to make all our money. We just got, it's going to be a seven to 10 year cycle. If you follow what the, what the standards are across the test of time, seven to 10 years from now, everything we're buying today is going to be worth exponentially more than. But again, the key metric that we use all the way through this is making sure there's cash flow because cash flow will always protect what you're doing and all that other stuff's a bonus for you on the back end. So in an effort to protect the cash flow, tell me, talk to me a little about your risk mitigation strategy as it relates to interest rates. Yeah, our risk mitigation really is one thing is always to make sure that you have operating capital, good operating expenses on hand. Um, interest rates, you know, you can't always control what's going to go on. I mean, again, if we had that crystal ball, we'd all, we, me and Neil would be recording this on one of our private islands right. or private jets and we'd be golden, right? Like we, yeah. we would have all of you there drinking my ties with us, but we're, yeah. we, we don't know. Um, you can guess what debt's going to be two years from now. And some of this is politics. Some of this is the fed. Some of this is past. Again, I'm a simple fireman. I, I look at it and say, if I can execute my business plan today, tomorrow will work itself out. And there's only so much you can worry about in the future. And if you concentrate on making the property, do what the property is supposed to do and execute on that property, then no matter what happens, you're going to be in good standing with your bank. They're going to want to work with you. You're going to be in good standing with your investors. They're going to want to work with you. And unfortunately, you just can't control it. I wish I had a better answer my gut feeling, uh, this is just strictly a gut feeling. Please don't anyone hang their hat on this. They got to do something. 2024 is coming. I know the Fed's supposed to be neutral, but if they want to stay in office, they got to do something. And they, they being every single politician, not Democrat, not Republican, every single politician, if they want to stay in office, they got to do something and they can't continue on this trajectory of pinching down the economy. And as layoffs happen, things will ease up and I guess we'll see what happens. I, I just wish I had a better answer, uh, but I don't have a crystal ball, so. Tell me a little about from a passive investor standpoint, when they're talking to an operator, evaluate an operator, what types of things should they be asking? How, how does one best evaluate a, an operator, general partner? I use those words interchangeably. Yeah, yeah. general partner, yeah. operator, yep. whatever you want to yep. call it. In the end, we, we tell our investors, look, man, like, you got the horse and you got the jockey and the horse is the asset class and, and the jockey is ultimately what you're betting on and you're betting on us. And I tell them, hey, like go investigate us, go talk to our other investors, go talk to us. I want you to understand what the asset class is. Like it, it's going to get to a point where you build this trust with your investors. They're like, whatever, I trust you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to understand what you're buying into. Here's the property. And most people really just care about how the money works. I'm like, no, we're investing in self-storage or multifamily. Here's what we got. This is how it works. Are you interested in being a part of this? If you are, then this is how the money works. And then, yes, you need to verify us. We do a lot with friends and family, and I, I call it co-investing. I know other people say, oh, come invest with me. We call it co-investing because you're truly a partner with us. Like, If any one of my investors said, hey, I want to get on a plane and go to Baton Rouge with you and go see the properties, let's go. I'll give you the whole roadshow from from Alabama to Texas up to Arkansas, I'll show you every single property. You tell me what you want to do. Come to Baltimore, show you all of our projects because that's important to us. Because in the end, yes, you need to understand both sides of that, but you're investing in the operator or the jockey and that's what you're betting on. Um, and I would say spend a lot of time vetting them. Um, you can get super technical on what your financial policies, what your you know, uh, distributions, how are you going to handle this? How are you going to handle that? And you can ask all those hard questions, but I would say most of the time, if you get a good feel from, from the operator and you can see past proven track record and you can confirm with other investors, that's a good vote of confidence there. And then from there, yeah, I just want to understand the asset class. Like I'm not, if you're going to tell me you're going to go, you're a great operator, but you're going to go buy stuff in Detroit, like, yo, I want to see a portfolio of stuff that you've owned and operated in Detroit or Baltimore or some of these tougher towns, because we know what it takes 
to go through them. And and we, I mean, I passively invest in some of our investors' deals. One of them is a hard money lender, and I fully trust him. But he always says, "Hey, I'm putting your money in this deal because he knows we have a little bit higher risk aversion." But we talk about every deal that we're doing when he places our money for us because. That's I think that's the best way to do it. Um, so is it, do I have a direct question to ask? No, um, it's more of a that track record and understanding people. And, you know, you might get more equity on a deal because they have less of a proven track record and there's higher risk. And someone who has a proven track record, you might get less of a deal, but you got more of a, a stable, predictable return. Um, and those are other things that you want to factor when you're looking at deals. When somebody is looking at deals, how do they... You know, what types of questions should they ask be asking on a deal specific basis, non-operator questions, but a deal specific, you know, they're looking at multifamily, they're looking at self-storage, it's a newer asset class for them. Where should they be going with that in their research? Yeah, I think a lot of people get caught up in like, yo, how are you going to lease? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? I, I think it's more of like, you want to understand intrinsically, like what the business plan is and looking at from a higher level. And, and it's funny because... People will put $25,000 in the stock market and have no clue to what they're buying. They just know that, I don't know, pick a stock, Google or uh, Tesla is hot. Tesla on paper is a, <laughs> they're losing money, right? Like, right. or they were anyway for a long time. Right. But people will toss $25,000 on that. And if it goes to zero, they're happy with it. Whereas if they put $25,000 with you on the investment, they do want to understand every single nitty gritty. And if it went to zero, they're going to, they're going to kill you. And I, I get that. I believe me, I truly get that. But in the same sense, I would say you want to ask more holistic questions from the top level and understand now if something's like really bugging you and you got to get it out of your head, like I don't understand how you can get leases when all these other people are having problems. Yeah, get nitty gritty. But I want to understand like what's your timeline to complete capital improvements? What's your timeline to cash flow to make distributions to investors? What's your timeline on refinancing? What's your business plan to get evict tenants during COVID? What if another COVID happens? And I'm on the other side of that, but if COVID happened again or some sort of lockdown or whatever, like, is there a way that you can mitigate risk for that? Like, I think you want to ask more of the questions on like the, some of those like higher level what ifs and understanding the marketplace, I think are the biggest things that you can do, especially as a passive investor, you could go on any one of these platforms and you could be investing your money all across the country. I have no clue. Neil's backyard at Des Moines, Iowa. I, I have no clue. All I can think about is cornfields. I, I can't even imagine that there's a but city there's there. I know, I know there's a city there, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. but in the same sense, it's like, you need to understand what you're investing into, what market challenges come from buying into a deal, especially if you're not operating in your backyard. And I would trust Neil to go do a deal in Des Moines, Iowa, but I would need to understand from him why Des Moines is great. Like, you know, what do they say? Iowa nice, right? Like, tell me what, tell me all about Iowa. Why is it so nice? Give me all, give me the information about the people, what kind of business is there and understanding that marketplace the same way we run the due diligence. And I think a lot of operators do a good job of explaining it in their pitch deck or their offering, but getting those questions answered and understanding what's happening to your capital inside of that deal uh, I think is the most important thing. When you look uh, forward to the rest of 2023 and beyond, where are you guys headed? What's it look like in your world? What are you guys buying? What are you excited about? We are excited about the opportunity that people are pencils down. We are excited on the opportunity uh, to find new deals, explore new marketplaces, keep our market diversification up. Um, interestingly enough, someone brought us a deal in New Orleans that we're working on that uh, it's a $25 million deal that's potentially a double, but it's got hair around it, right? And yeah. brokers know that we're willing to take on deals with hair and work through those situations. Most people aren't. Most people want the easy, like, here's the path. And we're like, oh, we'll take that $25 million deal and try to get it to 50 million by fixing this one problem because it's a land lease deal that we can convert back to fee simple. And then the REITs will chew it up. Correct. Well, that's the case. We're sitting on a gold mine. Um, so we're looking forward to all these um, opportunities that are coming up. The other big opportunity that I think is going to come, it's, I don't know if it's going to happen in 23, but sometime between now and 24, 25, assuming nothing happens leading into the elections, 
is a lot of people took super cheap debt from 19 to 22. And if they did not execute on their business model, I don't want to curse on your show, but they are screwed, right? And they're not going to be able to refi. They're not going to be able to meet the new debt service coverage ratios because the the, the rate adjusted to some stupid rate. Right. They're going to have to come up with equity. And if they're not performing on their deal, I believe it's going to present itself with an opportunity to purchase a lot of deals um, at a discounted rate because operators need to get out of these deals that they did not execute on. Because a lot of people were like goldfish and just bought and bought and bought and bought and didn't execute. Um, I even found ourselves buying too much stuff saying, all right, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a go guy. If you guys follow me around on, on social or wherever, everything's Ian Harwich, that's LFG, right? Like I'm ready to go at any given time, but we even had a, my business partner's like, yo, dude, slow down. There's going to be more deals because you can only do so much and execute so much within your bandwidth. And I think that's where a lot of opportunity is going to present itself between now and I would even say into 26, because depending where debt goes, a lot of a lot of operators are going to have problems. And again, they were buying three, four caps with 2% debt and debt's now 6%. And if they didn't execute the business plan and drive rates, whether it's multifamily, self-storage, industrial, any asset class out there, they're going to have some problems. And I think that's where the opportunity lies going forward. My, I couldn't agree with more with you. In fact, I, I, I deemed it the red wave. A whole bunch of things are going to head back and they're going to have to, they're going to be faced with a, an entirely new reality. Yep. So, oh, something's, 100%. Something's going to have to give. We bought a $12 million deal in, uh, what was that? November of 21, just for a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. We got 3.125% on three-year money. I mean, that same money today is going to be 6%. So right. like, we're mad, you know, when I say, hey, I might be in that same realm, it, it happens, dude. Like, I got to make sure that we're executing that business plan every day, because guess what? In a year, I need to refinance or I need to take the rate adjustment. And it could be, it could be troublesome. It happens, right? Like, um, but it's all things that you navigate. And by being in good standing and putting the property first and executing your deals, hopefully you don't end up on that red wave side of things. Mm -hmm. But I think the red wave for Neil, myself, and other good operators, there's going to be a ton of opportunity that's coming. Just need to be patient. We're we're kind of in that. I tell people we're in that slack tide. You know, we're going yep. from high tide to low tide, and we're just waiting for the water to decide which way it's going. Is it coming in or is it going out? And once it figures out what it's doing, that's when the buy opportunity, the strike's going to happen. So I want to move on to the final segment. What I call the final four. What do you think holds most in passive investors back from hitting their personal next level? Uh, it's not only passive investors, it's mm. also operators. Um, what it takes to go from an operator standpoint, one to 5 million or a passive investor from investing 25 grand to a hundred thousand dollars is a risk tolerance, readjusting their thought process, getting out there and saying, man, this worked for 25 grand. Why won't it work for 250 grand and just try it and go and get out there and be comfortable with how that works. And most operators and passive investors alike, man, life's comfortable. I'm good with that 25 grand out there. I'm good with 50 houses. I don't need to do commercial assets. And they don't want to take on the hard part to going to the next level. You got to blow up everything that works for you. Um, and we're in the process now, right? We went from a small company to almost $100 million of assets under management with 13 employees. We're blowing up everything, including accounting. You know how painful that is? to have something that has worked for you for such a long period of time that you're like, yo, this stuff doesn't work anymore. We got to blow it all up. And we're back to startup days of like working to 10 o'clock at night and busting our asses. I'm like, man, what a world. Like, it's like taking you back. And most people get scared of that. And it's on the operator side and the passive investor side is as you level up, you need to be willing to take those next steps to start it over and blow it up and do it again. What are you passionate about outside of real estate? Outside of real estate, I enjoy, uh, it's almost warm enough. It's we're getting there is going to our boat, um, you know, getting out there. I'm a bigger guy, but I will wake surf and get out there and fish and just spending time on the boat. Uh, I recently got my private pilot's license. So that's been a nice. little passion project of mine. I've been out flying and looking at planes. So 
Um, but just getting out and exercising the brain, obviously spending time with the family, exercising the brain outside of real estate. Cause it's so easy to stay locked in. Yep. They give you this, I'm holding up my phone again. Um, mm-hmm. it's so easy to stay locked in all the time. You need to find some sort of outlet, uh, to get you out there and just do something different. Your favorite book. Ooh, my favorite book is Atlas Shrugged. I mm-hmm. tell everybody you yeah. need to read it. I am not a reader by any means. 63 hours on audio. Yep. First hour or two, I was like, dude, I don't know why everyone tells me to read this. And I got locked in and it, I read it during the 2020 elections. And it was like, I'm like, how does this book from 1940 something like resonate to today? It was, it is so wild. It's, um, it's, it's just an amazing story. Anne Rand was so, so ahead of her time. And it's such a good book. I tell everybody to go out and read it. What's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? My favorite way to make an impact in the community is to help other first responders like myself. Um, too many first responders use their hands and their brawn to work. And they don't think about how they don't think about past today. They're always putting other people forward. And I try to tell them, Hey man, you need to secure your financial future, whether it's becoming debt free just from a, a consumer side of things uh, or getting out there and owning an active business or buying real estate. That's a passion of mine, um, you know, coming from that field. I get why we get paid what we get because they use our competitive advantage against us that we love helping people. Um, but in the same sense, it is a job that is becomes thankless after a while. And I love helping them and securing financial future and taking care of their families going forward. Um, that's my biggest impact that uh, both not only myself, but my business partner are passionate about Um helping first responders, finding financial freedom. We launched the Maverick Vault, a collection of resources available to our listeners. I understand you're making a contribution. The ebook on how to navigate the the hottest asset class, self-storage. Tell us a little about that contribution. Yeah, so we wrote a a white paper ebook on uh, the hottest asset class. It has been and has continued to be here for a hot second is self-storage. And it's a great business. I just want people to understand that it is not that much more passive than residential real estate. Just your problems, like we were talking about before, just a little different. You're not doing a ton of CapEx. You're doing a lot more management. It's a forward-facing business. I want people to understand, hey, like when you get into self-storage, here are your pitfalls and what you need to watch out for. And it gives you a good enough overview that if you wanted to go out and execute a deal, I think you could do it in that 13 pages. Um, And if not, it gives you more information on the asset class. And there's a ton of information out there between YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, not only for myself, but some really good operators out there that will get you going in that direction. So hopefully it helps you on your journey and your path to investing in a self-storage deal or real estate as a whole. That's a wonderful contribution. You guys can get that at www.themaverickvault.com. It's been a wonderful conversation. It's a fun story to hear about what you came out of coming coming out as a firefighter and having to having to give thought to how do I how am I going to make this go and how am I going to get to a future that I want to ultimately want to create for myself. Having to have some deep questions of yourself. It's it's truly inspirational for people. They want to they want to find you. They want to follow you. They want to connect with you. Where can they go? What should they do? Yeah, if you uh, if you want to find us, equitywarehouse.com. Uh, we have some case studies on there of how we co-invested uh, with our friends and family on some of these bigger commercial assets. If not, we're out there on Facebook, Equity Warehouse, Instagram, uh, Twitter. We're on all the social channels. You can find us most active on Instagram. You can find us there, Equity Warehouse. Um, and we post content all the time. And, uh, you know, you'll see some clips from our podcast and uh, appreciate you having me on and, and being able to provide value to your audience. And if we can ever help out, just let us know we're here. Ian, thanks so much for your time. Wonderful conversation. To our listeners, pat yourself on the back. You guys have made it to the end of the show and most people never finish what they start. If you receive value from today's show, be sure to share it on LinkedIn, your Facebook page or your social media platform of choice. Subscribe to never miss a valuable episode in the future. And if you found value in today's episode, give us a thumbs up with a positive review. If there's a particular topic you'd like to hear about, well, I want to hear from you. Shoot me a message on LinkedIn. The link to my profile is below in the show notes. You can connect with me there for more valuable content.